Welcome to the lab, Introduction to X-ray Physics and Diffraction. The goal of this lab is to understand the basic operation of an X-ray diffractometer and to record the energy spectrum of an X-ray tube. The X-ray apertures consist of three main subcomponents. The first is the X-ray source, including the X-ray tube and the aperture. The second is the target. A sodium chloride crystal is used as the target for most part of the lab. The third part is the sensor, a Gagamula counter, which records rate of the reflected X-ray from the target. First, let's take a look at the X-ray tube. X-rays are created when fast-moving electrons hit a metal target. Only about 1% of the energy of the electron beam is converted to photons. The rest is converted to heat. The electron beam and the target are enclosed in a glass tube, which must be evacuated. Otherwise, the electrons will collide with the molecules in air, losing energy before they reach the target. There is a filament on one side of the tube, which is heated by a separate electric current passing through it. The filament serves as the source of the electrons. The electrons released from the heated filament are accelerated by a high voltage towards the anode. The potential difference between the cathode and anode is usually from 20 kV to 100 kV. When fast-moving electron hits the anode, it's decelerated and loses energy, which is released in form of an X-ray. The angle on the anode directs the X-ray beam. The heat generated during the X-ray production can be a problem, and if without cooling, could melt the anode. The X-ray tube used in this lab utilizes a heat sink and ventilator to cool the anode. X-ray output is plotted on graphs called spectra. An X-ray spectrum is continuous, and the intensity reaches zero at a certain maximum energy point. In addition to the continuous spectrum, depending on the accelerating potential, there may be discrete features superimposed on the spectrum. These discrete X-ray features are due to characteristic radiation. The continuous spectrum is due to deceleration of electrons hitting the target. This type of radiation is known as Bram's drawdown. The intensity drops to zero at a certain maximum energy or minimum wavelength when electrons transfer almost all energy to photon energy. A characteristic peak is created when a hole in the inner shell created by a collision event is filled by an electron from a higher energy shell. Suppose a K-shell electron was snuffed out. The vacancy can be filled by an electron from the L-shell, which results in a K-alpha radiation, or by an electron from the M-shell, which results in a K-beta radiation. This experiment records the energy spectrum of an X-ray tube with a molybdenum anode. A goniometer with a sodium chloride crystal and a Gagamula counter tube in the bar configuration together comprise the spectrometer. The crystal and the counter tube are pivoted with respect to the incident X-ray beam in a theta to theta coupling. The atoms of the crystal function as diffraction grating. Constructive interference of the scattered radiation occurs in accordance with the Bragg's law when n lambda is equal to 2d sine theta. Where D is the space between atomic planes, lambda is the wavelength, and N is the diffraction order. For sodium chloride, the lattice constant 2D is 0.564 nanometer. In this lab, the directly measured angular spectrum can be converted to the wavelength spectrum by using Bragg's law, and the wavelength spectrum can further be converted to the energy spectrum of the X-ray by E equals HC over lambda. A Geiger counter consists of a Geiger molar tube, which detects the radiation, and the processing electronics, which displays the result. The Geiger molar tube is filled with an inactive gas such as helium, neon, or argon at low pressure, to which a high voltage is applied. The tube briefly conducts electrical charge, and a charged particle or photon of the incident radiation makes the gas conductive by ionization. The ionization is considerably amplified within the tube by the Townsend discharge effect, to produce an easily measured detection pulse, which is fed to the processing and display electronics. Connect the power supply and make sure the RS-232 cable is connected to both the computer and the diffractometer. Before doing the lab, we need to perform a few safety checks. Make sure all windows are fully intact and main window opens and closes. To open, first press the black button down and then slide the window to the left. Make sure the interlock system is functioning by listening to the latch mechanism to engage when the sliding window is closed.
Make sure the window cannot be opened without depressing the black button. The filament should switch off when the black button interlock switch is depressed. The high voltage should turn off as soon as you start to open the window. You should normally turn off the high voltage manually before opening the window. The HV on slash off button turns the high voltage on or off. The black adjust knob is used to alter all inputs. Clockwise rotation increases the value and counterclockwise rotation decreases the value. The U button is used to set the extra tip voltage. The I button sets extra tip current. Delta T sets the acquisition time per data point. Delta beta sets the angular step size, typically 0.1 degree. In this experiment, consider beta and theta interchangeable. The beta limits button sets the lower and the upper angular limits of the scan. The sensor button rotates the detector and defines the two theta angle. The target button rotates the crystal support stage and defines the theta angle. The coupled button rotates both the target and the sensor with a step size of delta beta for the target and step size of 2 delta beta for the sensor. The zero button moves the target and the sensor to zero position. The reset button functions like the zero button but additionally sets all parameters to default values. The scan on slash off button starts or stops one of the three scan types. Next, we need to perform a calibration before we proceed to do the lab. First, place the crystal on the crystal holder. The lower the crystal out of the path of the X-ray. Set the voltage to 30 kV and the current to 0.1 mA. Rotate the sensor manually until the X-ray count rate is maximized. Turn off the high voltage, open the sliding window and raise the crystal until it is not against the stop. Turn on the high voltage and rotate the target until the count rate is at the maximum. If the alignment is good, then this count rate should be about half of the original count rate without crystal in place. Simultaneously depress the target, coupled, and the beta limits buttons. This should initiate the recalibration sequence and move the goniometer to zero position. Consider when the source, the crystal, and the sensor are perfectly aligned with each other. With the crystal in place, most of the X-rays that hit the crystal cannot pass through, due to the fact that the attenuation length of the X-ray is much smaller than the length of the crystal. Therefore, compared to the case without the crystal, the intensity received by the sensor reduces to about half. To test whether the calibration is done correctly, with the crystal in place, Rotate to a strong black reflection of the crystal. Remember to turn the voltage to 35 kV and the current to 1 mA. Then rotate independently both the crystal and the sensor away from the central angular positions. Ideally, the count rate should drop in all cases. A misalignment of 0.1 degree is acceptable, however, if angles are off by more than 0.1 degree, try repeating the above alignment sequence. The goal of the first part of this lab is to investigate the molybdenum target energy spectrum using the sodium chloride crystal as an energy dispersive analyzer. This is achieved by scanning the crystal through a range of angles and the X-ray detector through twice this range. To launch the X-ray apparatus application, go to the Start menu and click on All Programs. Then go to X-ray apparatus folder and click on the X-ray apparatus icon. Make sure the PC communicates with the diffractometer. To check the communication, simply click on the red arrow button. If the communication is good, the parameters on the display should agree with the actual parameters of the X-ray apparatus. Also, the angle readouts from the application should reflect the actual angles of the target and the sensor. Set the X-ray tube high voltage to 35 kV, set the current to 1 mA, Set the measuring time per angular step to 1 second, and then set the angular step size to 0.1 degree. Press the coupled key to activate the electronic coupling of the target rotation and sensor rotation. Click on the beta limits key once for the lower limit and twice for the upper limit. Set the lower limit to 2.5 degrees and the upper limit to 10 degrees. Press the HV on slash off button to apply high voltage, then start the scan by pressing the scan on slash off button. Scan data should show up on the X-ray apparatus graphics display. To show the wavelength spectrum, open the settings box by clicking on the two key icon, then select the correct lattice constant for the crystal. To show the energy spectrum, simply select molybdenum anode from the energy conversion drop-down menu. The conversion between the angle and wavelength and the conversion between the wavelength and the energy are shown on the top left of the graph. And don't forget to save your data at the end.
Now increase the acquisition time per data point to 5 seconds and take data for two voltages of 35, 30, 25, 22.5, 20, and 15 kilovolts. Remember to save data to a file for each setup. The graph here shows the overlay of spectra for all six voltage setups. Return the tube to 35 kilovolts and now take data for tube currents of 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2 milliamp. The graph here shows the overlay of spectra for all five current setups. For the final procedure in this part, set the voltage to 35 kilovolts, the current to 1 milliamp, and the time per data point to 10 seconds. Then scan from 10 degrees to 25 degrees so that you resolve the second and third outer K lines. The fraction of X-rays from crystal can be used to study properties of the X-ray spectrum. In the meanwhile, a precisely measured X-ray spectrum can be utilized to study properties of crystal. The goal of the second part of this lab is to use Bragg formula to find lattice spacings associated with other crystals. For example, to measure the lattice spacing of mica, simply replace the sodium chloride crystal with mica and try scans from 2.5 degrees to 25 degrees. Calculate the lattice spacings for all crystals used in this lab. The graph above shows the angular spectra for all crystals used in this lab. This plot shows a lambda over 2 versus sine theta for sodium chloride. The theta used here are measured values, and the wavelength used in the feed are established values. Assign a 0.1 degree uncertainty for all measured angles. The fitted lattice spacing is 0.2831 plus minus 0.0006 nanometer. By fixing the sensor and scanning only the target crystal, you will be sweeping through the black condition for a set of crystal planes. This is known as a rocking curve. We mount the sodium chloride crystal and scan just two black peaks, for example, first outer K alpha and third outer K alpha. Only scan the target angle a few degrees, with the sensor fixed at twice the central angle of the peak. Plot both rocking curves and estimate the full width at half maximum.